Okay, so last chapter when we add closures, our interpreter actually messed up a little bit on some uh, semantic stuff in some counter case. So, so uh, first is a quick refresher about static scope or lexical scoping. So it means the scope of variable and uh, means uh, the the variable name. What, what variable is a uh, variable name refers to is can be decided at a static phase of programming. You don't need to run a, run a program to decide where, um, what, the what the scope is. And instead, instead the compiler can just deal with that for you. And this, uh, the book then gives a more for kind of formal uh, definition of this. A variable usage refers to the preceding declaration with the same name in the innermost scope that encloses the expression where the variable is used. So this is a very dense sentence. And they talk about this is still nowhere near as precise as a real language specification, which is also true. It is already a very dense sentence, hard to read. So first, a variable usage. It says variable usage instead of uh, expression because they also assignment. And the preceding is means uh, before in the program text. Innermost is because because the sh the shadowing in locks, and we will pick the inner one. And this rule makes no mention of any runtime behavior. And thus it implies that a variable expression always refers to the same declaration through the entire execution of the program. Our interpreter so far mostly implements it correctly. But when we add closures, we have something, something weird happening. So the problem is actually not, not actually because of closures, it's beca just because how this interpreter is constructed. It always have this problem, but closure let it manifest. If we have some other stuff like a nested class or something in the language, it will have the same problem. Uh, yeah, I ran into this bug like, when I was writing tests for the last chapter or when we added uh, closures. And yeah, so I got stuck on this. So I was happy to see that we address it in the next chapter. Yeah. Yeah, the, 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 problem, the problem is we kind of introduced dynamic scoping to the interpreter inf implementation when we said it, the language is statically scoped. We, I think it's a classic error, like one of my PL professor just, just talked about how it is so simple to accidentally introduce dynamic scoping, whether to language spec or to the implementation. It's just very easy mistake to make. 
I think for for interpreter it's far easier than a compiler though. Yeah. So here here we have a global variable and we have closure and it's supposed to print this global and here is right. And here we have a new local variable which should have no effect whatsoever, but then at here when we print, we print this local variable. So the problem the problem is about our environment being mutable. So our environment, remember it's just a hash table and it is mutable, we add stuff into it. And at, at, start, at start, we have a global scope, this global environment. Then we ex then we enter the block. We have an environment for the block, and then then we have a little closure, you know, the environment for the closure, which the its parent is the environment of the block. So everything is fine at this point. When we when we invoke closure we need to find A. A is not in the block. So we go back a layer further and we find A is in global. So we get this global, which is correct behavior. But then when we go into this line, we actually insert a new variable into the block scope. So now it has a new A at here. And when we invoke show A, the closure again, it finds this A. So at, at the end, we print this local variable. Everyone understand this part? Just to make sure why yeah. this bug happened. Oh, I should ask if anyone doesn't understand this part. Okay. Yeah, just make sure because it's, if you get lost, then I feel like the later part will be just less and less useful. And and then, yeah, the the book talk about. The scope of the scope of a block is not necessarily the same all the time. Like when we have a variable A, it's like the scope is A. When we have another variable B, we have we actually have the scope is A and B, but then In, in in here we only we only have a we don't have a uh, I'm sorry sorry I, I was speaking nonsense so in, in here we just add add b into add b into the scope so we have scope with both a and b if we create a, cl uh, create a closure at this point at this point we are not supposed to refer to b but then we can so that's our mistake.
Uh, also, then the book talk about persistent data structures. So this is one of my favorite subject, actually, persistent data structures. So there is a style of programming that solve this problem nicely in functional languages. So in functional languages, for example, if you code the exactly same thing, for example, uh, in Scala, Elm, or whatever, that provide those uh, position data structure in the standard library, then you, you won't even have this problem. Because a persistent data structure can never be directly modified. And you always create a new, any modification, you always create a new structure. Yeah, but and, a bunch of other problems though. Like, so like for the example, like in locks, if we use persistent data structures everywhere, we would like we would just end up copying everything a million times. And then we wouldn't be able to figure because like like for this specific bug, the problem is that we're not copying something that should be copied. But like most of the times in locks when we are mutating something, it's because we actually want to change it. But if instead of changing it, we wanted to change it, if we had to like copy it and do it again then it would be really slow. So like oftentimes when you're working with persistent data- uh, like, So I, I guess like in Rust, there is like, well, the pattern is uh, called, uh, what is this called? The... Just sorry, in the mutability or something? I don't uh, haven't heard of that. Uh, yeah, interior mutability. So I guess for the persistent data structure, the idea is the same. So the data structure itself is not mutable, but then inside you can say, oh, inside inside we doesn't actually store the value directly. We store a reference to the value, and the reference is immutable, but the value is something we can change. Um, that's, so the, way, that's so the a, reference is immutable, but the value I see. So is that just like yeah. programming languages that have like a var and they have like a const or something, or like a const in C++ like on the left hand side, where it just means that like the the thing that you're referencing, like the variable or whatever, isn't like you can't reassign it but you can mutate the reference to it or the value. Yeah, so so that's that's a trick of using position data, uh, position environment. So you have a pretty static environment which cannot change. And then you have a mutable storage that can change. Mm, okay, interesting. Yeah, and the storage is actual memory and the yeah. environment just refer to the storage. Yeah. Yeah, but well, also persistent data structure kind of map really nicely with languages that like most of stuff are just immutable or like all stuff are immutable, for example, then you don't even need to use this kind of storage trick. You just, just everything just works really nicely. Mm -hmm. And um, there is a further comment about sounds like it might waste tons of memory and time copying the persistent data structure, but actually, actually they are trees. 
and it share most of the part. And by trees, people, some of the people here might think it's, oh, it's super cash unfriendly or something. Well, they also think about that because they are trees, but they are trees with white nodes. So actually position that structure is an interesting topic, but that's not the solution we will use in this book. Because Java doesn't have those data structures. And using them means we probably need some third party libraries. And we need to restructure a tons of the code. So the book will just not do that. So we will keep the way we represent the environment the same. And instead, we will make some static resolution into the access operation itself. So instead of changing how we represent the environment, we will introduce some uh, semantic analysis to our interpreter. Um, and then it talks about, first our interpreter, when we resolve a variable, we, when we resolve our variable, we track down which declaration it refers to each and every time the variable expression is evaluated. So there, there are two problems with this approach. First, it is slow because Remember, we have static scope, so this information is supposed to be always the same. We will always refer to the exactly same environment. And now when we execute a line of code, but we just, when, whenever we access this variable, we need to go through the hoop of uh, oh, it is uh, existing in the local scope. No, let's look up the chain. Look at the parent. Is, is it existing in the parents? No, then look up the chain again. So super expensive. And another point is that this is dynamic. We, we have, we already have the static scoping and the dynamic implementation as we saw before, it is really easy to mess up and introduce dynamic scoping into it. So a better solution is to resolve each variable use once. By write a chunk of code that inspects the user program uh, and find every variables and figure out which declaration it refers to. So this is the example of a semantic analysis. When the parser, the parser talk about whether a program is like syntactically correct. And semantic analysis goes a little bit, bit further and to analyze, uh, to analyze the semantic of the program. And in our case, the analysis is quite simple. It's just variable bindings. So actually the binding part, the book talk, talks about, talk about it. Uh, there are a lot of ways we can store the binding between a variable and its declaration and a lot more efficient way compared to our current environment approach, but 
we don't care about efficiency in in this in this part of the book essentially and we will just have something running and for the second part when we write the C interpreter we will care about those so instead we will just use an easy approach there to work with our existing code base and so that's how so the way we actually make this work to work with our existing environment is uh, first time we need to go up the train like twice to get global. And the second time we suppose also go up the train twice. But we find A here. Uh, so the approach we will use is just to a semantic analysis and find how much we need to go to, uh, to find uh, to find the global variable uh, no, to find oh, well, to find the like correct variable for our scope. And in this case, if we do semantic analysis, it will say two. So it will say, just say one, and then at runtime, we just say one, two, and find this global variable and ignore this local. This, this still sounds super inefficient at runtime. We don't solve any like efficiency problem, but again, we don't care about efficiency in, this interpreter. And then the book talk about we are calculating a static property based on structure of the source code. And the obvious, I don't know, the obvious answer is to put this path just directly into the parser. And the, it's, he says it's a traditional home and it's where we'll put it later in the C version, but he will write the resolver as a separate path. So anyone has experience writing a compiler here can come on, can come on down like we'll do name resolution as a separate pass or like in the parser. No comments? This is my first comparer. It's not even a comparer, it's an interpreter. Yeah, I, I don't know. I'm not a compiler engineer, even though I really want to write a compiler. I just feel like the separate pass approach will make the code a lot cleaner, even though we probably need to work the tree one more time. Yeah, I mean, in general, just thinking about it, it probably makes more sense as a separate pass. But if you want the compiler to be really fast, like doing it in the parser is probably faster since you're going to be walking the same tree, too. So it probably makes like, like if you really wanted to optimize it and you had it in two separate, uh, passes you would probably combine it into one pass anyways yeah i guess also depends on the language yeah i i can like name resolution in language like uh for example python is probably you can just put it in the parser for something like c++ it's 
so monstrous and I guess you definitely need a separate pass for that. <laughs> uh, yeah, but C++ also has notoriously terrible compilation times. I mean, I don't think that's why, but... That's, that's definitely not why, but yeah, C++, C++ already have a lot more going on in the parser row. And yeah, I don't think the name resolution is why CPAPA's compilation time is so slow. It's probably it has some impact though, but I'm I don't think it's a major contribute. So, so the so the approach the book uses is that we have a variable resolution pass. We will do a single work of over the tree and resolve all the variables it contains before the interpreter start to executing the code. And it talks about additional passes between the parser and execution that are common, for example, type tracking, which I added in one of my interpreter before. It's a static typed language, but it is also, I just let it interpret it because that's easier to implement. But, uh, I just put a type tracking pass there. So our variable resolution pass works a lot like our uh, just interpreter. We all we like similarly we like walk the tree visiting each node, but uh, static analysis is different in terms that we, first we don't have side effects. And second, there are no control, control flow. That's the same for what, whatever uh, static uh, semantic analysis we are doing. We always don't have side effect and we, we won't have control flow. So loops are always visited once. So we don't need to worry about for into like infinite loop or something. And for branches, we need to visit all the branches. Logic, logical operators are also not short-circuited. We need to visit all the branch. Uh, and it's further comment on the variable resolution touches each node once. So it is O of N. Some other analysis may have greater complexity, but you probably need, to, need it to still be linear or not far from it. Like, like all N log N is probably still okay, but if you use some algorithm is O N squared, then we have a problem. But actually, just think about this. I I always when I learned about how like uh, type inference work, I I always feel like the algorithm complexity of net algorithm is n cube or something. But it's working practice. I so I don't know. Yeah, I've never this comment. type checker but I'd imagine it's a disaster. And I mean, you can see that, I mean, if you've ever used a you know, program with a type checker, you know it's really slow, so. 
Well, it really depends on your type system because yeah. like if you've got a really simple type system, you probably could have it implemented in ON, but if you get something yeah, type inference. Going on. So yeah, I'm no, specifically talking about Hindley Miller type, how you infer it. I, I feel like uh, I, I'm speaking out of my head, so it's it can very likely be wrong, but I feel like it's O of N cube that the algorithm. There's probably more factors. Like, what is N in that case? I feel like it's, yeah. Uh, like, I feel like it's a multi. Yeah, N is the, just the size of the program. But yeah. I guess we, usually when we do this algorithm, we do like, for example, one function at a time or something. So. I mean, I'd imagine it's like a factor of like how many identifiers there are and then how yeah. nested the types are and I don't know, other things. Yeah, just those, yeah, those kind of things. I, I cannot remember the details, but that's a conclusion I got a few years ago. I feel like that's like in theory that the algorithm, the complexity just blows up, but in practice, it works fine. Mm -hmm. So another reason big O is useless. <laughs> and Like everything in Java, our variable resolution paths will be a class. And this class implement the visitors. We need to visit expressions and we need to visit statement. And both for visitor avoid because we will just accumulate data inside the class rather than return. So when we do the resolving most, for most of the uh, AST node, it doesn't matter. We will just do nothing. Only a few uh, kind of nodes are interesting when it comes to resolve the variables for a block because we introduced a new scope. For a function declaration, it's all also introduced a new scope. And from bind this parameter into that scope. A variable declaration add new variable to the current scope. Or I guess the alternative interpretation is a variable declaration create a new scope and put that variable into that scope, into the new scope. And using of variables, so variable expression or assignment, we need to have their variable resolved. The rest of the nodes don't do anything special, so we just need to implement the with method to pass down because they may contain, they don't do anything special, but they may contain those. So when we, so to, to resolve the block, we basically resolve the inner part of block, but then we kind of wrap it around with like beginning scope and end scope. We start with beginning scope and end with end scope 
for, for resolving the inner statement, we basically just call resolve again, just walk down the tree. So, and for each statement again, again, we just walk down the tree. And it's the same for expressions. So nothing, nothing interesting here. It's all the visit, visitor boilerplate. Those interesting part is the begin scope and end scope. For the begin scope, uh, we first we need to have, we need to actually represent a scope. So in our resolver, we represent scope as a stack. We have a map. We have a map of string, which is which is variables, and the, a boolean, which we will talk about it later. So now you can just think about it as a set or a set of strings. And. And then we have a stack of them. So because it's a, um, just for, because a scope can have parents, so it's a stack. When we begin scope, we push a new scope, which itself is a set of um, variables into the, into the scopes, into the stack. And, when we end scope, we will pop it back. So this by itself doesn't seems to do anything because we, we calculate this stack and then we discard it at the end. So I feel like the order of this book talking about this part is a little bit weird because for the next few sections, we just talk about how we calculate this stack and then at the end we discard all of it. And so that's kind of where I read this part. It was a little bit confusing. <laughs> yeah, because it takes a long time before we actually solve the bug in the beginning of the chapter. Yeah, it's it's it takes a long time to set this thing up and then we can actually we actually use it basically i'm not sure if i like this approach but it was a bit confusing when i read that so resolve Resolving variable declaration. And we need to do this little dance of separating the declaration and definition in order to handle this, this case. So the problem here is that what to do when the initializer for a local variable refers to a variable with the same name. And depending on the language, different language choose, choose different semantics. For example, run the initializer then puts a new variable in the scope. And that will be run the initializer using the old, var old variable and then put a new and then put a new variable into the scope like so we are essentially doing this. Mm. 
The second is put a new variable in scope, then run the initializer. This is uh, this is really weird behavior, which is we need to observe a variable before it's initialized, and which means we need to give them some default. And in our in our language logs, we have a new, so we will probably just use that. The third one is make it an error to refer to a variable in its initializer. And then he, he claims that the first two, no one wants the first two, so logs will do the third one, which I, I actually disagree. Yeah, don't, doesn't Rust? Uh, Rust do the first, first one, option. yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Also, like OCaml does the first one. It's, uh, yeah, know. Swift too, because you often use that for like if lets or something. Yeah. So, yeah, the first one actually, the first one is actually pretty useful. I think. I think that's well, a bit different in a uh, statically typed language, though, because like in Rust, if you're declaring a new uh, variable, oftentimes it's like it has a different type, whereas in uh, Dynamically typed language, you can just like reassign stuff however you want. Yeah, so in a language yeah. logs, I guess it doesn't really make sense. Yeah, I yeah, I guess so. Unless maybe you wanted to like mutate it, if that was the idea. So then, no, I could still see it even in a dynamically typed thing. It's well, yeah, I guess in logs it doesn't make sense, but also it doesn't harm. But also, I guess you just don't need two ways to do the same thing. Yeah, no, but I'm saying it could make sense in locks because if you want to, yeah. you want to mutate the thing in the inner scope, then you could do that trick where you say, you know, var a equals a, and then you can change it inside the scope somehow. I don't know. Then, then why you need a separate variable? You don't need a separate variable to mutate it. Um, no, but if you don't want to change the original one. Oh, wait. No, no, no. Yeah, I, I see what you're saying. Yeah, I feel like in the static type language, it definitely makes more yeah, sense. Yes, a lot more helpful there. I'm pretty sure C without warning to the second one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And also, it's not even new. It's like uh, yeah. default initialized, which means for uh, for stuff like integer, it's uninitialized. <laughs> let's let's check whether C actually do that because I can't even remember. Yeah, it compiles fine. Wow. <laughs> That's crazy. Yeah, I didn't know that. What about C++? <laughs> yeah, C++ okay. is no better. <laughs> Although you're not, yeah, it's not. Hopefully there are warning settings for that. Well, no, definitely. Yeah, wall and all that stuff. No? Yeah. Yeah, usually, yeah, even with this kind of minimum warning, we catch that, so. Yeah. Not a not a problem problem in practice, but it's just <laughs> interesting. Yeah.
And yes, well, because CIFAP has inherited from C, so <laughs> including all those weird nonsense choices and add, add its own nonsense choices <laughs> on top of it. So we will make it, we will make, so we will choose the third option, which is make it a compile, compile, compilation error. And we will first declare, we will split in the binding into two steps. So first, we're first declaring the variable we like pick the scope from the scope chain. So we get, get the current scope. And then we just put our, we just put our um, current, our declared variable to it. And that is what this Boolean is for. It's for whether we think the variable is ready or not. In this case, it is not ready yet, so it's uh, false. And when we when we actually define the variable. We, we will say it is true, no longer false. I don't know what this is for. This should never happen, right? Uh, are you saying because you already declared it? No, I mean this line. I don't know this line, what it is for. Oh, um. And the book doesn't say anything. I feel yeah. like this can be assert. Its scopes should just never be empty. Yeah. Because you at least always have a global, right? Right. Yeah, I think that makes sense. I don't know why I didn't think about that. Oh. Or maybe global is special in their case. And I was just slop sloppy when I read the book. So if global is special, then this line may kind of makes sense. This oh, line yeah, basically yeah, says it's global. That is what we do. Because when we hook it up to the uh, interpreter, we go through, like we look through all the scopes. And then if it's not in any of the scopes, then we return it from the global scope. Yeah. So, so if if global is special handled, then it basically says if it is global, then we don't do anything. And so now, now between the between the declare and define phase, when we do the initializers, we actually have this intermediate stage where our variable is not ready. And if we encounter not ready, we and here we just give an error which is uh, first it's about resolving variable expressions. So actually when we use this variable and when we use this variable, if we encountered, we find a variable which is not ready. We just, 
give an error instead. So after after that check, after that check, we call this function resolve resolve local. Where where we kind of climb up the uh, scope chain. And to say like whether whether it is contained, whether the variable is contained in that scope. So this part this part is what we used to do in the interpreter in the in interpreting, but now we move it into the semantic analysis. So we just we don't need to worry about it being dynamic anymore. And if we find the variable, we just resolve it, pass in the number of scopes between the current innermost scope to the uh, to the variable, which is this. If we walk through the block scopes and never find the variable, we just leave it unresolved and assume it's global. Okay, I see, we, we do treat global specially. Yeah, sorry, when I, I guess when I read the book, I was just being a bit sloppy. And for assignment, for assign, assignment, we actually can just use the existing code. We first need to resolve the, like the right-hand side of the assignment. And then we resolve the local, which is our helper. I will help us here to resolve the variable usage. And for function function declarations, function declarations first we need to put the function name into the scope. Because I guess we can do recursion in logs and then we resolve the function itself. Then when we resolve, resolve function, the same we can do begin scope and end scope. We put each parameter, we put each parameter into the uh, into this current scope. Notice both here and here we just declared immediately followed by define. We don't need to do anything in the middle because because for function names and for the parameters we we don't need to worry about the the name if the case of the name is used when we are not supposed to use it
I guess for parameter, we can, in theory, what if we have something, we have default parameter like this. I guess logs don't have default parameter, so it doesn't matter. But yeah, what if we had default parameter and someone did something really evil like this? <laughs> Yeah, well, I mean, with default parameters, that actually makes sense, right? Yeah, I've, uh, I guess for default parameter, uh, I guess well, my choice is default parameter cannot use other parameters, so we can't even do this. Because otherwise... Oh, yeah. For... Yeah, I guess it doesn't make sense to do that, so... But just saying, like, yeah, this I is how Python is too, right? Uh, I don't know. Maybe this actually makes sense to say that, like, the first, the the second by default is whatever passed into the first. Otherwise, otherwise, if you have an explicit value, then do something. I think in Python. No, Python, I think you need to use an idiom though, like pack whether it's null, it's null. So if it is null, then assign it into some default value. Uh, you can't yeah. just directly do it in Python. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I, I guess just this is so also a really weird edge case how the language should deal with that. Yeah. But in logs, we don't have default parameters, so everything is simple. We, we can just do that and... So in the Spencer, in this snippet that you sent, was I was saying if A was already defined, like outside of the function, Yeah, also, but see, wait, A, is not, A, is, yeah, A is not defined in if uh, just in the, if we don't consider we have another A. We, we oh, can't just. Oh, I see now. Yeah. We can't just use the A as is. If we want to do something like that, uh, we need to do this. Right, okay. Yeah, maybe I was confusing it with like TypeScript or something, but TypeScript has weird rules about it. Something does, I don't know. Uh, I guess do this. Yeah, we need to do do something like this. Got it. That makes sense. So we will also use this method to resolve logs method when we add class later. And once it's ready, once everything is ready, we resolve the function body. Yeah, I think this pattern makes sense for everything. Yeah. And then also like when we do like the like expressions and if statements, that all 
makes sense. I mean, those are all pretty straightforward. Um, yeah, those are those are just just basically do nothing. Just yeah, passing exactly. down. Like, it's just, don't really matter. Because yeah, it, just passing like, down and yeah. And those are just basically bullet plates. Yeah, so things start getting interesting again is when we actually try like interpreting it, right? Because then we actually go through when we have to like, you know, step through things and compute distances. Yeah. Yeah. Currently, currently we just create that stack and discard it. We haven't yeah. any, actually do anything. So, well, it is it is said that in tutorial you should never say something is easy because it can yeah. be insult for people who think it's not easy. But yeah. well, in, in this case, yeah, in this case, I guess it's okay to say it's easy. It's, yeah. Those are just boilerplates. So, so far, each time we visit a variable, we, we, um, we still haven't done anything, but we also haven't actually used that res this resolve. Uh, we have we haven't actually defined that resolve function. So actually, when each time we visit a variable, we need to tell the interpreter the how many scopes there are between the current scope and the scope where the variable is defined. And at run at runtime, we need to look this information up to and get exactly the number of environments between the current one and the enclosed one. And the way the resolver communicates with the interpreter is through this function, resolve, which we just haven't defined. We just use. Yeah, we just use it everywhere, but we don't actually know what it does. No, the, this overload has a separate Has a separate like this separate parameter, so actually it's just used in here, I think, because it's here is actually a variable get introduced. So it's this function we haven't defined yet. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And it passes an expression and a depth. Because for each expression, they just use its address as hash. So it's like that's the identity of the expression. And We have another, we have another like local uh, map with expressions, integers, and then like expression map to the depths for every local variables. The book comments that we can put this information into AST, but we don't.
because putting like putting those information into ASD will just make ASD more and more bloated with like irrelevant information and it also needs to change our ASD generator. And it's further comments, if we have like tools, like IDs, for example, we need to create a language server or something, which is actually a more likely situation compared to actually we create a language implementation. Yeah, I hadn't heard of that before, but that makes sense. You, you heard of what? Like I, I hadn't, I hadn't heard that argument before, to storing that information separately. But it makes sense because mm -hmm. as an IDE or some other program, like if you want to like incrementally, uh, repart reparse the program, then it'll make sense to, like, fit, just get to quickly off. figure out what changed. You know, just run the parts that you want to run. Yeah. Well, in incremental compilation is a really deep. Uh, I recommend this responsive. So this is some Rust folks when they talk about how they make they try to make Rust C kind of more incremental. Cool. Yeah. I'll take a look at that. Hi, uh, yeah. They, yeah, they talk they talk a lot of this stuff. It's it's a hard problem. Mm -hmm. I actually want to learn how they do this because I want to create a language and I want uh, the language implementation to, to be able to do this. But it is an overwhelming topic. Also, I, I feel like this idea to put, put things not in, not in the like object itself, but put it aside is also, have ever have you heard uh, stuff like data oriented design? Yeah. Or like entity component system. Yeah, it's also highly related. Just coming from different fields, but come to the same conclusion. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, a lot of time, a lot of time, this kind of thing is a better way to solve a problem. And a little bit more import of hash map and the map interface. Oh, this is cool. I guess I am so rusty with Java, like even doing, <laughs> even true. they can infer this a little bit, I would think it's cool. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, in Colin, you don't even need the angle brackets. You can just infer it. That, that I don't care that much. <laughs> I, I just want, I don't want this kind of information duplication. Yeah, I agree. This is really nice. Yeah. And for access, our resolved variable, when we visit to the variable expression, we just call this helper, which it takes the name and also takes the expression itself. 
we get the distance we get the distance from the the map we previously have and use the exp expression as the key and if we if we find it then we know we just find it in the corresponding environment with this distant variable. Otherwise, otherwise we say it's just so we don't find it. It's then it's global. So the I guess in in here the scope is static, but the variables themselves are still dynamic. Like because if we can still at runtime we don't find the name because you know, the global is dynamic. So I guess the name the name resolution is still not totally static in logs because yeah because of the globals. And if we get a distance, then we call we call this get at, which we defined at here, which calls another thing called ancestor, which finds the uh, uh, correct uh, uh, correct environment with this distance. And inside the ancestor, we just walk up. Again, we don't care about efficiency. Otherwise, otherwise, it feel like we spend so much time to calculate this distance, and we do we still do this for loop every time. But well, here we just don't care. And there is a comment about the interpreter assumes the variable is in the map. Which means the interpreter code trust the resolve, or trust the resolver uh, did its job and resolved the variable correctly, which implies a deep coupling between those two classes. We have implicit assumption when class about another doing its doing some work and it's it's not checked. And uh, he talks about here ran into a couple of subtle bugs when the resolver and the interpreter code were slightly out of sync. And one tool to make that easier is to have interpreter explicitly assert using Java's assert statement. In, in here, we just, in here we don't, if we don't do the assert, it still will be a runtime error. It's just a Java exception. So at least I guess this kind of coupling We'll get, if something went wrong, it will still get caught at least. If it's in C, then we need to be even more careful. And then for the assignment, well, for the assignment, we also, also needs to get the distance and assign to the correct distance or global. And for the assign add, it's the same thing. We need to find the ancestor and then put it into it.
And yeah, those are the only change in the interpreter. And that's the whole reason why he choose to uh, for the resolver to use this distance, which is super inefficient because we still need to work up the chain, but it makes the uh, interpreter uh, implementation easier. And then at the end, we need to run the resolver. Which is just like that. But resolver, resolver need to pass some information to the interpreter. So we actually need to pass the interpreter in. Personally, I I don't like this approach. I feel like resolver just just accumulates this local map like offside, and then we pass this local map into the interpreter. I feel like that's a better approach, but whatever. Yeah, I thought this was really weird the way that we did it. Yeah, it just feel like backward kind of bad op kind of thing <laughs> but, yeah, yeah. And it's also like, what does the resolver have to do with our program like like why does it have to be like at the very top of our program i don't know like very i need to be of... part of the interpreter or well she need to be part of the parser part of the interpreter like even if even if we implement it as a separate class like we do in this chapter i still think it should be part of like when we create the interpreter or something. No, no, it's a separate pass. Putting it into here is correct. I just don't want to pass interpreter into it because I feel like interpreter comes after the resolver. Oh, I see what you're saying. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so then it would be more like the, right, because that's like how our, how the scanner and the parser and the interpreter have worked before this. Yeah. Yeah, so putting it into here is correct. If we have type tracking, then we will have a type tracker again at here. Yeah. So now at the end, it talks about uh, a little bit error handling. And uh, first it talk about this code, which logs don't allow, logs only allow uh, declaring multiple variables with the same name in the global scope, which feel like it's really inconsistent, but this, this, is, this is for the REPL situation and special, special case for the global and then for in the local scope, it's just done a lot. And yeah, this situation will be detected because without this line, when we do this, it will just, I guess, will overwrite the entry in the map. This depends on the language API though. Some, some API, some API will probably say, we probably have a, uh, API that is if something already exists, you cannot you cannot put it. Instead, it will throw an error. Oh, and return at top level. This I feel like can be a syntax syntax error, but 
with how log syntax is structured, I guess it is not. So in this situation, again, we will do it in the semantic analysis. Where in the resolver, we introduce a function type enum, which uh, currently is known and function. I guess later, later he will also add uh, more cases, I don't know, now function and method and what else? But, but anyway. Maybe when he introduces classes, it'll be like add a method. Uh, oh, like class, then we do the class constructor, like stuff like that. Yeah, or methods. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Hey. So yeah, we will read that chapter later, though. So yeah. So we can resolve a function declaration. We pass that in. And we also need to do this dance. This yeah, is this is the kind of the same thing, same thing that our machine when we uh, create a new stack frame, it store the previous stack pointer. It's a lot like that. We just store the previous function type and then restore that at the end. I feel like in a language with REI, we we should automate this part. This this pattern of store an old value and then restore it at the end. <laughs> or even with uh, like a defer statement or something similar. Yeah, well defer makes like you put all the, the ending parts, all the cleanup stuff in the defer. Yeah. And yeah, we need to add another uh, error check at here. So before actually interpreting, if we already have error, then we quit and just report the error. Yeah, I already have than... between like each of the seeds in my interpreter. Sorry, what? So you already have that. Like, so yeah. in each stage in the interpreter, I always like check for errors and then return if there is a problem. Yeah, yeah. I guess it's just depend on how the interpreter is structured. Mm -hmm. If if in a language with, for example, a result type, for example, then we don't even need this line. It's you just like, if it have an error, it will not even continue. Yeah. So here is a comment about how many different analysis to lump into a simple single pass. The choice is difficult. Many small isolated paths is 
uh, simpler to implement and maintain. However, there is a runtime cost of traversing the syntax tree itself. Yeah, that's it. There are no like after node, which is sad, but we already talked about uh, our and the half. So yeah. Cool. Any last minute discussion before we end the recording? Okay. Let's end recording.